Um, hi there, uh, and welcome to our talk on are your secrets uh, secure in OpenStack? Uh, my name is Dave McCowan, and I'm an engineer for Cisco, and I work in our private cloud engineering group on uh, security hardening and security features. And uh, my name is Douglas Mendizabal, and I'm the current PTL for Barbican, and I work at the security DFG for OpenStack at Red Hat. So um, our talk today, if I uh, break out our title, Are Your Secrets Secure? First, uh, discuss a little bit about how secrets are used in OpenStack and why it's important to keep them secure. And then we'll delve a little bit and sort of define secure. How do we measure security in terms of storing secrets? So then we have, uh, we'll develop a scorecard to, uh, to rate uh, how secure se secret um, storage is. Uh, then we'll talk about the different options you have for storing secrets in, uh, in an OpenStack cloud, and then we'll rate each one to see how secure it is. So to start off a little bit, uh, when we talk about secrets, we're usually talking about uh, cryptography, and there's different ways of using cryptography uh, in your cloud, different uh, use cases. Uh, so the first is you want to protect uh, your storage, the, the data at rest in your cloud, and you want to protect it possibly for a couple different reasons. One is privacy. You want to make sure that uh, people who, who have permissions to access it can access it, and then people who don't have access uh, are not able to access it, um, even through back doors. And it also, by encrypting the data, it becomes tamper resistant. Uh, there's no way to uh, edit a, an encrypted file and, and hope that you come up with, uh, with something uh, reasonable and tampered. Uh, se second use case for encryption is authentication. Um, so knowing a secret, whether it's a passphrase or uh, part of a key pair, can be used to prove uh, your identity, uh, either from the client side with a passphrase um, or uh, SSH key or from the server side where you have your uh, X509 certificate with a private key to prove your authenticity uh, on the server side. Uh, another use case is uh, secure messaging, or basically securing encrypting data uh, in transit. So this could be HTTPS or SSH, TLS. Um, and finally, there's a use case for uh, validating the integrity of software you may want to run. Um, so by signing software, you can check the signature against um, the, uh, the value you can, uh, the hash of the software, and you can validate both the source of the software and that it hasn't been changed uh, since it was packaged. Then how this applies uh, in OpenStack, um, protecting storage, that's in the realm of Nova, Cinder, uh, Swift. Uh, you'll have these encryption keys, then Nova will need to have a place to store them. Um, for authentication, proving identity, um, Octavia and Magnum will do that. Octavia is for, uh, for load balancer and Neutron, and as you create load balancer instances, you want each of them associated with the appropriate um, tenant that started the load balancer. And for Magnum, you have different um, clusters of uh, containers that might be starting, and you want to know who has permissions within each cluster to, to talk. Uh, secure messaging, um, also Octavia, Magnum. And finally, uh, the software integrity use case, this is uh, Glance and Nova working together. Before you launch um, an image from Glance and Nova, you can check the signature and, and make sure that it's a valid uh, image before it's booted. So this brings in key management. So we've identified a number of different OpenStack projects that have a need to, to store a secret. Um, to, each project could have its own way to store a key, but uh, key management becomes a better solution. Um, it brings value to the equation from a couple ways. Uh, first, it centralizes all your uh, key storage. So if you put all your keys and all your secrets in one place, you only have one thing to secure. So you can uh, tighten up the security around it um, all the way. If the, these secrets were stored by each project in different ways, you would have to do the same protections in lots of different places. So uh, centralizing the storage uh, is a good idea. Uh, next is uh, audit access. Sometimes you need to wind back the clock and, and know who accessed which secrets when. Uh, with a centralized key manager with a good audit log, you'll be able to um, um, to do that. Um, in, addition, uh, in addition to storing um, these encryption keys, it's also important that you have good ones to begin with. So you want to generate random keys uh, with a good source of entropy. Um, that sometimes is hard to come by uh, at cloud scale in clouds. So by centralizing your um, generation of keys uh, to specialized hardware, you can come up with uh, better encryption keys. So that's uh, another feature of key management depending on your deployment. And um, also by centralizing your key manager, you have an opportunity to take advantage of specialized hardware for storage as well. And this, uh, these are HSMs, or uh, hardware security modules. 
So when you look at centralized key management in OpenStack, that's the project Barbican. Barbican is the key manager for OpenStack. And um, just like any OpenStack service, it starts off with a front end of a, a RESTful interface. Uh, this interface, uh, to send requests to it, um, you start off with a Keystone token, so that takes care of your authorization and authentication. And the objects that Keystone will work with is uh, secrets, um, orders, which is a request for a secret. That's the uh, generating a, an encryption key for you that we talked about on the previous slide. And then finally, secret containers, which are, are bundles or groupings of secrets. Uh, sometimes you want to group a bunch of passwords or a bunch of keys together in one bundle just for convenience. Um, so access to these, uh, Barbican supports two ways using Oslo policy, one uh, through role-based access control. Um, and the second through access control list. So you can tune um, who has access to, um, to which secret in a, in a variety of ways. And then access to Barbican, um, just like all OpenStack projects, you have a variety of choices. Um, there's the RESTful interface that you can hit um, um, you know, directly with, with curl or um, so forth. There's the OpenStack CLI, which gives you a, a command line front end uh, to that RESTful interface. And finally, there's uh, Python bindings, so you can uh, get your secrets uh, programmatically to, uh, to automate your things. And also, uh, consistent with other Barbican projects, you have a variety of plugins uh, that we'll discuss about through, um, through this presentation. And um, this sort of defines how you actually store these secrets. And we'll go into that in more detail um, a little later on. So evaluating secret storage, um, I'm gonna introduce five different uh, criteria that we can use to evaluate um, how secure or appropriate uh, secret storage is for your cloud. And the first consideration is security itself or basically the hardening of your secret storage. Um, there's a couple different uh, facets to this. One is um, you wanna provide strong protection for the secrets, the actual user secrets that you're storing in the cloud. Uh, but there's also a second layer. Usually these secrets are protected first by encrypting the keys themselves before you store them. So you also need to protect those master keys. And so we'll talk about different uh, approaches for protecting those master keys. Um, another item for consideration is isolation of keys. Uh, you have your, your data that's encrypted and then you have your keys. And ideally you want to keep these far apart because uh, in the end if you put your data in the encryption key um, directly on the same hard drive, that becomes pretty dull because that's something that can be defeated by a, a hacker or a rogue admin if you get access to that actual hard drive. Um, another uh, valuable hardening point would be to actually have different access rules for people who have access to keys and people who have access uh, to the storage. So different admins, if you have your storage admin separate from your security officer, um, that would be ideal because one person alone can't um, access um, uh, user data. Um, next, you want to think about the, the integrity of the storage. Um, you want something that uh, your keys can't be tampered with. And also, depending on uh, your business and your location, there may be uh, different uh, standards that you need to comply with. And that's another uh, facet to consider as you look at secret storage. Um, the next pillar we want to look at is uh, the maturity of the solution you may want to choose. Um, this will be a trade-off, uh, maybe personal to you. You have an option to choose a very mature solution, something that's been tried and um, uh, all the kinks have been worked out by other users before you. But also, uh, with any technology, there's a lot of new development and innovation going on all the time. So maybe you do want to try something new, a uh, new open source project or new hardware that comes out um, all the time. Uh, there's options that uh, leverage both, as uh, we'll see in upcoming slides. Um, another consideration is ease of use. Um, need to be careful to look at the different facets of ease of use. Um, there's installation ease of use. Uh, some uh, back-end storage solutions you could use are, is very simple. Uh, one line of config and, and off you go, you're done. Um, but then that may bring in ongoing complexity with operations. If at some point you need to do uh, a rekey uh, to rotate your keys, it uh, becomes difficult if that's not designed into the solution that you chose. Um, another uh, idea for ease of use, if you have an existing key management system uh, in your infrastructure and you want to uh, just point your cloud to that, uh, that would definitely uh, help your ease of use. And then the final two considerations, uh, one is uh, scale. Uh, so we're building clouds here, so we want something that can operate at cloud scale. Uh, so that includes high availability. Um, you wanna make sure that your secret storage is highly available, because if you can't get to your key, then you can't get to your data, uh, basically uh, bricking your, your instances. 
Um, you want something that's uh, durable. Again, if you lose your key, you've, you've lost your data essentially, so you need to make sure you have a solution that uh, is, replicates itself and uh, is disaster uh, resistant. And you also want something that's appropriately performant. So depending on the number of volumes or instances um, or activity going on in your cloud, to have something that'll just keep up with the volume and uh, capacity of secret uh, requests and secret storage that uh, you have needs for. And then finally, uh, we live in a real world. We have to pay for this. Um, uh, some choices can be very cheap if it's software only or if it leverages existing um, investment. Uh, that can be a low cost solution. Um, if you want to, on the other um, end of the spectrum, if you have specialized hardware, especially big specialized hardware for cloud scale, uh, it can be very expensive. And uh, that's a trade off that you'll uh, need to manage. And then uh, finally, I want to quickly highlight uh, compliance, since I mentioned that uh, a few slides ago. So just a few highlights. Um, obviously, all these um, compliance standards are very long documents uh, that need to be, be read through. But um, just a couple of key points that uh, come to my mind when I look at these and thinking about key management. So with uh, GDPR as a privacy standard, and, and one of the components is if a user says, hey, forget about all the data you've collected about me and, and prove that to me, uh, that can be pretty difficult, um, especially in a cloud because uh, the data can be you know, copied and backed up and virtualized, and you're not sure exactly where it is. But if the data is encrypted with a, uh, a particular key, and then you can delete and wipe that key, then that data is effectively lost and forgotten. So you may have uh, met that requirement, and if you can show an audit log that a key is lost. So uh, there's maybe some, uh, some benefit there. Um, another standard uh, is ANSI um, in, in France, and um, a lot of the themes through that standard is talking about uh, different roles and separation of roles. And this is the case where you want your security officer to have access to the keys, but not access to any of the storage drives. And then you have your storage administrator who can, um, you know, takes care of the maintenance of the hard drives, but can't access the keys. So in this way, having two separate roles here, you've uh, protected uh, the user data from exposure. And uh, this can be built into your, uh, your key storage architecture. And then uh, finally, a common one is uh, common criteria. Um, they can bring about uh, maybe minimum standards for key length for encryption that you'll want to think about, and also audit logging, which is built into Barbican, so that uh, you should be covered there. So there's some, some compliant highlights. So now we've hit um, different things, different criteria that you use to measure security in a cloud. Um, quickly, um, uh, two things to... Um, so when you design your cloud, uh, your deployment, um, there's a couple choices to make. So first, um, you decide on your architecture of your cloud. Um, you've got a couple choices here. Uh, we've decided we have an OpenStack cloud. We've decided we're going to run Barbican because we need key management. Now we get to decide where do we want to deploy Barbican. Um, so Barbican is a shared service uh, in OpenStack, and shared services such as Nova, Cinder Glance, those APIs usually run on your controller nodes in your cloud. And that's a pretty reasonable place to run it because Barbican is also a shared service. So that would be a reasonable place to, to install Barbican on, on those controllers. However, if you did want to build some separation between your OpenStack administrators and your key administrators, maybe you want to spin up a, a separate set of servers and have uh, key controllers essentially on separate servers. So that would also be appropriate. Um, a bad decision would be to run Barbican on your storage servers because that's where we violate um, the separation of the storage and encryption keys. So uh, some, some good or bad choices there. And then the next choice in your deployment um, after you've placed Barbican is um, which backend do you want to choose? Do you want to store your circuit? Um, and, and there's a variety of backends that Barbican uh, supports, and uh, we're going to go through some slides now to talk about different choices you can make. Um, at a TIE level, there's two types of uh, backend storage for secret storage. Uh, one are database adapters, and in this case, um, you have an encryption engine that encrypts the key, and then the data is, is uh, stuck into a database. Um, that's one approach. And a second um, backend uh, storage choice you can make um, types are the KMS adapters. And these, you actually take the secret and store it right into your K KMS. And there's a couple uh, choices we'll talk about going forward. So the, uh, the first plugin uh, to discuss is called the, the Simple Crypto plugin. And we can use this as a baseline comparison for the other ones. Um, as you might guess uh, by the name Simple Crypto, uh, is it secure? And it's like, eh, maybe not. But uh, it is a valid use case to discuss, and it's probably the most common uh, uh, one. Uh, certainly, we use it for development. Uh, we use it in the gate. You, know, you probably use it for proof of concept. Um, and the way it works, we start off with the user on top, and the user wants to store a secret. So it sends a post to the Barbican REST API. 
uh, Barbara can sees that it's configured for the simple crypto plugin. And so it knows to look into the Barbican uh, configuration file. And so for simple crypto, it's simple because there's only one key, and that's the key encryption key or KEK. And that's, this is the, the one master key we use for simple crypto. And that's stored um, in the Barbican config file. Um, so the plugin can then encrypt the, uh, the user's secret and then stores it into the Barbican database. And there you see the encrypted secret um, is sitting in the database. So really straightforward. Um, Let's apply this uh, plugin then to our, the, the scorecard that we've built with the five pillars that I introduced. Uh, so the first question is, um, how secure is this? Um, so the encryption, the protection of the user keys is by a single global key. So there's no multi-tenancy. It'd be nice if you protected keys for different tenants using different keys. Um, so that's a strike against simple crypto. Um, there's no system separation, our Barbican and the configuration, the storage all together. So that's a strike. And then the master key, the key encryption key we talked about, is sitting in a configuration file um, on the same server. So that's, uh, that's not great either. So from a hardening security point of view, um, all strikes. Uh, from a maturity point of view, though, it's, uh, it's very mature. It was the first one that was developed. Uh, it runs in the OpenStack gates with every commit. Um, um, it's used by developers all the time. So it, uh, it really is a mature solution and, um, and rock solid. Um, ease of use, sort of a mixed bag, uh, very simple to deploy. Just uh, give it a master uh, key, stick it in the Barbican config file, and, and it works. Um, but rekeying becomes um, uh, very disruptive. Since we only have one master key, if that master key needs to be rekeyed or is exposed, um, then you need to rekey all your secrets. Um, with just one layer, you probably then need to re-encrypt all your data with new keys um, uh, that might be at risk. So uh, uh, not really possible to do uh, rekeying in a simple crypto uh, scenario. Uh, however, it is very uh, scalable. Um, uh, it's just a database for storage. Uh, it's, uh, it's very uh, performant. It's just one simple step for each store. So uh, scale works uh, really well. And the cost, of course, is free. It's built into Barbican. So uh, uh, sort, of a, sort of a mixed bag, but definitely a good starting point uh, worth running in a, in a proof of concept uh, and giving it a try. Now I'll hand off to Doug, and he can start talking about some of the uh, better choices for secret storage. Yeah. So. Um PKC has a little plugin. This is what uh, typically we like to think of as the standard um, deployment of Barbican. And the way this works, if we trace sort of the path here, is a client will post a secret to Barbican. Barbican will see that it's configured to use PKCS 11. Uh, and it'll use that PKCS 11 device to do all the cryptographic work. Um, as far as where the master keys are stored, there is a master encryption key and a master uh, HMAC key in the HSM. And those are configured to be non-retrievable, so they're protected by the HSM at all times. Um, we also do uh, two layers of, of key encryptions here. And so every tenant that sends a request has their own project key assigned to them. And those project keys are encrypted by this master key that lives in the HSM. And then, um, that project key is what's actually used to encrypt the secret uh, that's coming in from the project. All that, uh, all that ciphertext is stored in the database. So if we look at the scorecard for this, um, how secure is it? We have a really good hardware separation. Uh, PKCS 11 is typically used with HSMs, and uh, HSMs have been around for quite a while, and their threat models have been you know, really well-defined and studied and stuff like that, so that's really good. Uh, master keys are really well-protected since they're not extractable from the, from the PKCS11 device. Um, a lot of these hardware modules are, have also been certified for uh, different compliance regimes, and so if you're looking for something that can satisfy uh, whatever ANSI or common criteria or whatever. You have a lot of choices as far as HSMs uh, to be able to do that. Um, and you're also, we also have a better encryption mechanisms that we can use uh, with PKCS11. Uh, some HSMs support authenticated encryption, and so that gives you uh, a little extra peace of mind as far as being able to, to detect it if anything's been tampered with. Um, maturity is kind of, um, kind of like a neutral here. Uh, the PKCS11 plugin has been around for quite some time. Uh, unfortunately, the PKCS11 is a standard, but it's not a very tight standard. There's some loose ends that vendors tend to interpret in their own ways. 
Um, we actually did a lot of work in Stein uh, to be able to support different mechanisms for different vendors. Um, we don't do any upstream testing of PKCS 11. We're hoping to, to change that in the near future uh, to at least test with a software-based NHSM. Uh, we don't have any hardware upstream that we can test with. Um, it does get a lot of uh, downstream testing. I know for a fact that at Red Hat, we test with at least two different uh, vendors HSMs with those. Um, it's also been, we've been recommending HSM deployments since I think since the beginning of Barbican. So, uh, anecdotally, um, a lot of people seem to have used it and, and it seems to be working for them. Um, ease of use, also kind of a um, mixed bag. Uh, we have a note here that's relatively complicated to deploy if you want to set up HSMs, especially in, in high availability modes. Um, everyone's sort of going to have their own way of, of getting set up, of enrolling your controller nodes with it, uh, and so forth. Uh, we did do a lot of work on Triple O to be able to deploy Barbican with HSMs as a back end uh, for both ATOS and TALUS HSMs. Uh, and so that helps with the with the deployment a little bit. Uh, one thing that is nice because we're using these two layers of master keys and project keys uh, is that rekeying is, is fairly straightforward. If you need to rotate your master key, you really only need to re-encrypt your project keys. And even then you could do it a, a sort of at a staggered pace. You can rotate your keys, have new secrets be encrypted with a new key uh, while you take some time uh, with an out-of-band process to re-encrypt everything. Uh, so it's not as disrupted as having to stop everything for simple crypto. Uh, as far as scaling, um, because uh, all the storage is done in the database, uh, the storage can be scaled just by scaling your database. Uh, failover and high availability is really gonna depend as to uh, what vendor you choose to buy an HSM from. Um, and then the, the sort of the big downside of this is that HSMs uh, can be really expensive. And so you're looking at a, a quite a heavy investment there if you want to go this route. Next, we'll look at a SGX plugin. Now, this was developed by a, a team of folks at Intel. And uh, they've, they've developed a, I want to say it's a, a backend plugin for Barbican that does all the, the cryptographic work in an SGS, SGX enclave. And it does all the storage in the database. Um, I'm not super familiar with the detail, the intimate details of this, but my understanding is there's a, uh, we've also got a master key there and a master HMAC uh, to be able to do the encryption there. I can't remember if we do multi-level encryption on this one. Uh, yes, okay. So it's very similar to the PKCS11 uh, plugin. So looking at, at, at the scorecard for this, security is good. We've got separation of, of your crypto process there to the SGX enclave, uh, and that's backed by Intel hardware. Uh, it also does uh, some that sort of vanilla Barbican doesn't do, and that's to protect database or be able to detect uh, tampering with database entries. Um, as far as maturity, this is uh, sort of the downside of this is that it's not part of upstream Barbican uh, and the Intel folks seem to not be maintaining it anymore. And so if this is something you're interested in, uh, it'd be something you have to go look at the code, make sure it still work and maybe maintain that going forward. Um, ease of use, I'm gonna go with a uh, mixed bag. Uh, may be complicated to deploy. You have to set up all your uh, controller nodes to, be, to enable SGX. Uh, and rekeying is possible here. As far as scale, uh, because storage is done in the database, uh, the storage can be scaled. HA failover is possible with it. Um, and the, what the Intel folks have said is that the performance is really good. Um, as far as scales, we're, we're unsure. Um, newer Intel hardware does have SGX, um, but if your hardware doesn't have it, you may have to go purchase a lot more stuff uh, to really use this. Uh, next plugin is a, a sort of a hybrid of SGX and PS, PKCS 11. There's a vendor called Fortranix that has developed a, 
an HSM-like system that leverages SGX for its security. Um, Barbican uses it through that same PKCS plugin we talked about earlier, and so a lot of the workflow here is the same. You still have that master key and master HMAC key in the key store, and you have a per tenant or per project project encryption key as well. Um, if we look at the scorecard for that, security is good. We, we've got hardware managing the master key. Um, there's some uh, nice features. We could, we could maybe do some attestation of Barbican using SGX. Uh, so that's something that maybe we could do with this that, that's not possible with anything else. Uh, unfortunately, there is no upstream gate for this. And I believe that plugin code is um, not available to us either, right? Um, they do, uh, Fortranix does support this, though, so if you're a customer of theirs, um, I imagine they, they'll guarantee the maturity for you. Um, another one that may be a little complicated to deploy because of SGX, uh, but rekeying should be possible just like in the regular PKCS plugin. Um, storage, uh, because it's Everything is stored in the database. That should scale just fine. Uh, and the performance is good. Uh, we're unsure about the cost of this. We're not Fortranix clients. So, uh, and I don't know if we would be able to talk about that if we were. So moving on. Uh, now we're looking at uh, sort of the different kind of plugins now. We're looking at KMS adapters. And the first one we're going to talk about is KMIP, which is another uh, key management standard. Some um, HSM vendors uh, provide a KMIP interface instead of PKCS11. And so what the flow looks like here, it's um, very similar, except that the storage of the secret data happens in the device. So Barbican is not sending the secret to be encrypted and then getting the encrypted blob and putting it in the database. Instead, it just tells the KMIP device, hey, here's a secret, store it for me. Um, and then Barbican just stores that reference to the secret in the database. Looking at the scorecard for this, um, security is good. We're still having, we're still separating that master key and protecting it with hardware. Um, all the secrets are actually stored in a separate system from Barbican, so that's good. Uh, as far as maturity, unfortunately, uh, the Contributors that were driving the main effort on KMIP have moved on to other things, and so we don't have any, anybody driving the KMIP driver uh, at this time. Uh, and the upstream gate is currently broken. Uh, we're hoping to fix it uh, sometime soon. Um, if you're interested in KMIP, we'd definitely love to get some help uh, to get that fixed up. Um, ease of use is really going to depend on your KMIP device. Um, as well as the scale, um, scaling out of this thing. Because the storage is done in the device itself, that's gonna be a limiting factor. Um, I know that was one of the reasons we ended up rewriting PKCS11 to store everything in the database is that we noticed that the device wasn't able to hold the amount of keys that we wanted to store in there. Uh, and then the cost, of course, is gonna depend on, on where you purchase your KMIP, but um, could be a lot. And then the last, I oh know you still got a couple of plugins to talk about. Um, next one I want to talk about is Doctag. Doctag is a key management system by Red Hat uh, and it's part of the IPA suite. Uh, so if you got IPA already, you may already have Doctag. Um, this is also a KMS plugin, so all the storage of the secret data is done in Doctag. Doctag itself is either going to store its master keys in an HSM that it owns or that it talks to or in a uh, NSS database in software. Um, Barbican is, again, only storing the metadata in its database. And so if we look at the security of this. Um, we're saying hardware separation is good. Um, or we actually have system separation. We are, we're deferring to dog tag to actually do the storage and protection of the master key. Um, dog tag is, or some versions of dog tag are certified with FIPS and common criteria. And so if that's something you're looking for, then dog tag may be an option. Um, we do test dog tag at the gate. So every change that comes through gets tested through dog tag. Um, so that's great. Um, 
Ease of use, it's pretty easy to install and configure Doctag. Rekeying is possible. Um, the downside of this is you're gonna have to maintain another system if you don't already have it. Uh, as far as scaling, uh, HA and failover scenarios are possible with Doctag. Um, Doctag, all the storage is done in Doctag's database, so that should be able to scale. Um, performance, we're unsure about. We haven't really tested this um, to try to find some performance limits for it. Uh, it does make a lot more hops, right? Especially if you have an HSM, you're going from Barbican API to the Doctag server to the HSM and all the way back, so uh, there may be some latency there. Um, for the software-only version of Doctag is free, so that's a, a, a good starting point if, you're, if cost is a consideration. Last plugin I want to talk about is uh, for HashiCorp Vault. HashiCorp Vault is another uh, key management system that's uh, pretty popular. Um, this is another KMS adapter in which all the crypto work and the storage is done in that system. And so again, Barbican is just going to forward that secret to Vault and let Vault encrypt and store it uh, in its back end. And Barbican's only going to store the reference to that, uh, to that secret in Vault. So security, uh, is this good? We are, again, separating a, into a different system where the, where the master keys and the, and the storage is done. Um, you, you may be able to integrate Vault with an HSM, although that's going to be a, a enterprise version of Vault. Um, one of the, the sort of the red mark here for security is that the Vault plugin in Barbican is not really that mature yet. Uh, so it does just have a, a very simple auth model now. We did add some new um, options in Stein. You're able to use app roles uh, for authentication now, uh, which is good, but we still don't have a way to do fine-grained policy or to apply fine-grained policy in Vault for different uses of Barbican throughout. So that's some more changes that we'll be working for, uh, working towards in train. Um, we are testing Vault at the gates, so that's pretty good. Uh, and we are continuing to improve it. So um, not as mature as the rest of the plugins, but uh, it is getting better. Uh, Vault's pretty simple to, to deploy. That's one of, uh, I think, one of the reasons why it's so popular. Um, it is possible to, to do HA and failover, uh, but some of the replication options are only part of the enterprise one. I think a uh, hot standby failover is part of the community edition. Um, performance, that's going to depend a lot on, on the back end that you choose for Vault. Uh, so we really don't have any, any performance metrics on how good or how fast this would be. Uh, cost is a mixed bag. You can get uh, a community edition of Vault, which will do a lot for you. Uh, but if you want to secure that with an HSM, then you're going to have to look into the enterprise version. So in summary, um, what should you use? If you're not using anything now, then you should use simple crypto. That's going to be better than just ignoring the whole key management problem altogether. Um, if your cloud has to satisfy some kind of uh, security compliance regime, then that's going to be a starting point for you. Uh, you can look into Doctag, KMIP, and PKCS11 for devices or um, versions of Doctag that satisfy those requirements. Uh, if you're not worried about any kind of stuff, then really you're, you're, you have a lot of options then. Um, if you're wondering, hey, I already have an HSM. Can I use it? Um, like we mentioned earlier, PKCS11 is kind of loosely defined, and so the best way to figure that out is just try the PKCS11 or KMIP plugin as it is now. Um, we did do a lot of work in Stein to, to be able to work with more HSM vendors, um, and I have a feeling that most, most HSMs will work without really much uh, change in code, just a little configuration changes. Uh, another thing you're going to want to consider is uh, what scale you want to operate at. Um, are you going to need to um, handle a lot of requests? You may need a lot of API instances. Uh, if you're going to store tens of thousands of keys, you might need to consider one of the plugins that source in the database instead of in a device. 
Uh, and also, you're going to want to think about your HA and failover options for some of the hardware-backed ones. Uh, as far as performance, uh, we don't really have a good baseline for comparison, so um, we'll see. <laughs> uh, I think that's all we have. Do you guys have any questions? Yeah. Sure. Or I can repeat it if I can if I can hear you. It's okay. So the question is, when you're when you're doing Cinder volume encryption, and you have a Barbican that has a hardware backend, what what data gets stored in the in a hardware backend? Uh, and the answer to that is going to be um, the the key you're using to encrypt the volume is going to be stored in the device. The, the encrypted volume is still going to be stored in Cinder. Yeah. yeah. So it's just, it's just the key that, yeah. that ends up in that back Yeah, end so the device. only thing that Cinder knows about is Barbican. So it's a common front end no matter what the, the, the back end is. And then Barbican has the configuration. And, and the only thing Barbican knows about is the keys itself. So that, yeah. uh, What version of triple O can deploy Barbican? So what version of triple O supports deploying Barbican? Um, OSP 13, which is what, Queens? Yep. So yeah, starting with Queens, you can deploy Barbican um, with triple O. And then starting with Stein, you can deploy Barbican with an HSM backend. So previous to that, uh, you can deploy Barbican, but it's going to be using simple crypto. I don't think we have any more questions then. Thank you. Thank you very much.